The Supreme Court has begun hearing oral arguments in regard to the two cases that are attempting to overturn Biden's student debt relief program. Now, it is clear based on the line of questioning and some of the commentary coming from the conservative Supreme Court justices that they are not buying Biden's argument when it comes to defending his decision to push for this program unilaterally through the executive branch. Remember, this happened through executive action. It did not happen through congressional legislation. With that said, the real question at heart with one of the cases has to do with something called major questions doctrine, okay? It's the requirement of congressional authority in cases with significant political or economic consequences. And so this just means that Biden can't act unilaterally, okay? That's the argument that is brought in this case against Biden. In June, the court invoked the doctrine in a decision that curtailed the Environmental Protection Agency's power to address climate change. So the argument there was you don't have the authority to do this as part of the executive branch without congressional approval. So that kind of sets a precedent in regard to how these conservative Supreme Court justices are likely to rule on this issue. The court also ruled on similar grounds that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was not authorized to impose a moratorium on evictions and that OSHA did not have the authority without congressional approval to tell large employers or employers of large companies, I should say, that their workers must be vaccinated against COVID-19 or undergo frequent testing. Now let's go to the Biden administration. The Biden administration argues that the coronavirus pandemic was enough of an emergency to wipe out some of the student loan debt due to the financial burdens that coronavirus has brought forth. As you know, tens of millions of people initially were laid off through no fault of their own. Many people suffered financial burdens as a result of the pandemic. And Biden argued, well, because this was an emergency, I had the authority to act unilaterally to cancel some portion of the student debt. Now, going back to what I had mentioned earlier, the the question about major questions doctrine. Okay, the law the administration relies on, the Higher Education Relief Opportunities for Students Act of 2003, usually usually called the Heroes Act, gives the Secretary of Education the power to waive or modify any statutory or regulatory provision to protect borrowers affected by a war or other military operation or, this is the important part, national emergency. Now, are the conservative justices buying that? It doesn't appear to be the case. I'm gonna give you some examples of what they're saying in just a moment, but Cenk, I wanted to give you a chance to jump in. Yeah, so uh, this is a really interesting case because a lot of times conservatives just, it's gobbledygook, they have no case at all, it's just nonsense. Like Trump goes into court and says, "Oh, there's still an election. They go, okay, show me evidence. He's like, I don't, know, I don't have any evidence. This is not one of those cases. This is an interesting close case potentially. But now let's give you context. That major questions doctrine that Anna referred to is made up. So this is what activist judges do. The Roberts court invented that. And they were like, well, we don't like some regulations. So we'll just invent a new legal precedent that, hey, if we think the regulation is just too much, a little too major, we'll say, we don't like it, it's now banned. And look at that, that winds up helping giant corporations every time because it deregulates every time. It's just another excuse to deregulate, just invented out of whole cloth. What happened, conservatives? I thought you hated activist judges. That's not written in the law anywhere, they totally made it up. Yeah, so let me add to that. So for instance, when they said, when this highly conservative Supreme Court said that the federal government can't do this rent moratorium, who mm -hmm. did it help? It helped landlords, right? Mm -hmm. in, in many cases, of course, corporate landlords, which I'm sure were behind that effort. Um, the other thing was uh, OSHA wanting to ensure that employers of large companies uh, have their workforce vaccinated. They didn't want to have to deal with that. So the Supreme Court jumped in and said, no, you, sorry, uh, these government agencies don't have the unilateral ability to, uh, to do this. No, the major questions doctrine helps uh, giant corporations nearly 100 out of 100 times. Maybe there's an odd case where it doesn't, but I've never seen it. And so, and by the way, Lewis Powell wrote a memo back in 1971 
explaining how uh, big business should take over the courts and they should have quote activist judges that make up legal principles to adva- to give advantage an unfair advantage basically he didn't say unfair in the memo but an unfair advantage to big business and that's exactly what they did okay but even so we're fair i get what they're saying yeah okay like they're saying look you're finding a little provision in a in a right in, in a in a bill and you're saying you're going to get to make a 400 billion dollar change based on that or another significant landmark change from the executive branch when i'm not positive congress meant that in that little clause mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. so i get the principle behind it so you see how fair we are and that's why this case could be a little bit closer than some of the other cases but the counter argument is also really good. Yes, so, so let's get to that. First, before we get to the counter argument, I do wanna give you some of the statements from the conservative court justices who seem to, again, wanna reverse what Biden did here. So Chief Justice John Roberts indicated that the administration had violated separation of powers principles by acting without sufficiently explicit congressional authorization to undertake one of the most ambitious and expensive executive actions in the nation's history. The Chief Justice joined by other members of the court's six member conservative majority invoked, as I said earlier, the major questions doctrine, which requires that government initiatives with major political and economic consequences be clearly authorized by Congress. Now, Elena Kagan jumped in and said, no, what the Biden administration did is absolutely protected under the 2003 statute. Justice Elena Kagan said that language plainly authorized the administration to act in light of the pandemic, adding that the court routinely considered really confusing statutes. This is not one, or this one is not, she said. And the administration also argues, and they wrote this in their brief, that the major questions doctrine, quote, does not justify overriding ordinary principles of statutory construction whenever an agency action can be described as consequential. Rather, the court has applied the doctrine only in extraordinary cases characterized by what the court has concluded is a gross mismatch between the agency's assertion of regulatory authority and the history and context of the supposed or supposed congressional authorization. In fact, Solicitor General Elizabeth B. Preloger or Preloger, who is representing the administration here, said its plan fit comfortably within the statutory language, noting that the Trump administration had also relied on the 2003 law. So, do you want me to give you an example of that? Sure, and, and yeah. I want to jump in why her case is excellent. Yes, yeah. so the one example would be how in March of 2020, President Donald Trump declared that the coronavirus pandemic was a national emergency and his administration invoked the HEROES Act to pause student loan repayment requirements and to suspend the accrual of interest. Yeah, so guys, let me break it down even more in layman's terms. So. Uh, The conservatives on the court say this is outrageous to interpret this uh, Heroes Act in this way. Uh, Eleni Kagan says, well, first of all, plain reading, which is what conservatives are supposed to be in favor of. It says that the executive branch has complete authority to do that in the case of a national emergency. So boom, we're already done. But okay, let's keep going. Well, has it been declared an official national emergency? Yes, you wanna know who declared it that? Donald J. Trump. So she's like, okay, wait, so your side declared it a national emergency. Mm And then, by the way, paused interest payments on those loans, which is great. Give credit to Trump for that, by the way. And Biden continued that policy. Now, do you wanna know how much that policy has cost so far? $100 billion. So then she asked, wait, so $100 billion that the government has already spent and that no one has any problems with in this exact field about this exact piece of legislation. And you say, but 400 billion for some reason doing the same exact thing is too much. Yeah. Based on what? Yeah, that's so arbitrary, right? And so, uh, should the billionaires suing to make sure students can't get debt relief win? No, they shouldn't win, right? Will they? Very likely, yeah. uh, because the conservatives here they don't care. All the judicial philosophy is just nonsense. Never listen to any 
blabbermouth talking about judicial philosophy. None of them mean it. They just vote for corporations almost every time. So, That's their only judicial philosophy. So one final thing, because all of this can get a little confusing. Remember, there are two separate cases being presented before the Supreme Court challenging what Biden did with his student loan debt relief program, right? So one has to do with a lawsuit brought forward by the states. Um, and so that includes Nebraska, Missouri, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, South Carolina. The other also has to do with um, former debt borrowers, like former borrowers basically, who paid off their loans or have loans outstanding, but they don't get to benefit from the debt relief program because they don't qualify for it. Remember, it's means tested and all of that. And it has to be federal student loans. If you went to a private bank and you got a loan that way, you don't qualify, okay? So the case brought by the two borrowers, Myra Brown and Alexander Taylor, also raised questions about standing. Brown is ineligible for relief under the plan because her loans are held by commercial entities rather than the government, while Taylor is eligible for $10,000 rather than the $20,000 because he did not receive a Pell Grant, okay? Okay, so Brown has no standing at all. They, he has nothing to do with this case. It's actually embarrassing to put that uh, person in this case. That means you're desperate and you couldn't find any real students to, that are affected by this. The other one is like, well, I could have gotten 10,000 instead of you know, 20,000 20, yeah. instead of 10,000. But you were helped by the, by the action, executive action. Oh, well, I didn't want to be helped by the executive action. Uh, but I wanted to be helped more, but I didn't want to be helped at all. My favorite part of this was Neil Gorsuch's statement while hearing these oral arguments. So we have a quick clip of that, let's watch. And then I'll give you the Biden administration's argument. What I think they argue that is missing is cost to other persons in terms of fairness, for example. People who've paid their loans, people who um, don't ha ha have plan their lives around not seeking loans um, and people who are not eligible for loans in the first place. And that a half a trillion dollars is being diverted to one group of favored persons over others. I think that's the nature of their argument in addition to, as you point out, the cost of the fisc. And and I didn't see anything in the memorandum that dealt with those kinds of questions. That guy argued on behalf of a corporation that wanted its employee, an ice road, truck, uh, ice road trucker, to essentially uh, continue driving in a winter storm and potentially die and freeze to death. Yeah, it's just, okay? just- You wanna talk about fairness? That guy's talking about fairness. No, this ain't about fairness, let's just keep it real. But anyway, go ahead, Jane. Sorry, just quick uh, uh, correction there. Uh, the trucker had pulled over to the side of the road and he already couldn't feel one of his legs. So he almost certainly had frostbite and was about to freeze to death. And Gorsuch said, if the corporation orders you to stay on the side of the road, even though there's no help coming and freeze to death, that's what you have to do. Fairness. Okay. Fairness. So now, if you notice in that tiny little clip, there was a couple of amazing things in there. He's like, this is, I think, what they, the plaintiffs meant. Yeah. In other words, they didn't even say it. This guy's like, here, here, idiots. Let me give you a better excuse. Yes, yes. Okay, because I'm gonna rule for you anyway. I don't, I don't like actually judging the case as if I'm neutral. That's hilarious. Okay, and then he says fairness. Well, I think what's fair. Who cares what you yeah, think? Yeah, you don't. If you want, if we wanted to know what you thought was fair, we would have elected you to Congress or to the presidency. We don't. We already passed the law. We don't care what you think about the law. The question is what. Is the law, yes. not what do you think the law should be? That is the definition of an activist judge. Absolutely. Now, finally, I think the Biden administration's argument in response to these, you know, these borrowers who are salty about the forgiveness program was perfect. The Biden administration argued that none of the challengers have standing. The states' asserted injuries were speculative or self-inflicted. The individual borrowers, the brief added, would be no better off if they prevailed. A ruling in their favor would not grant Brown and Taylor the additional debt relief they say they desire. Rather, it would mean that nobody gets any debt relief at all, the brief said. And that's exactly right. Guys, to give you a sense, again, layman's term, uh, terminology here. So let's say somebody uh, attacked you, broke your arm, you're suing, right? 
and uh, you say, hey, the cast costs this much, the doctor's visit costs that much, and hey, in a civil lawsuit, I want my money, right? But in this case, they're saying my arm is broken, and I don't want anyone else treated for any health ailments. Wait. Insane. What, look, if you want your compensation for your arm, okay, that's an interesting case. If you're saying no one's arm should be set, and that no doctor should help other people with broken arms, it doesn't matter that that's a lunatic position, but you just don't belong in this case. This case has nothing to do with you. That's not a part, I mean, if they let that stand, it's insane. So anybody can go into court and go, I'm, I'm not affected by it at all, but I don't want that guy getting the money. <laughs> right. Okay, that's crazy. That's the whole reason why the concept of standing exists in the first place in court decisions, so that randos can't walk in and go, I don't like it. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.